thank you very much. I'd like to thank the uh, to be here. Uh, what I want to talk about today is some very much work in progress. Uh, it's joint work with Filippo Calderoni, and basically it's a case of there's stuff that we set theorists were doing, there's stuff that category theorists were doing, they did basically the same thing. And so this is an attempt to bring them together in one unified framework. Um, and the hope is we can get interesting things from category theory back into set theory and the other way around, and hopefully some new fine distinctions. Okay, so uh, the clicker doesn't seem to be working. There we go, okay, good. So just a refresher, Borel reducibility, if we've got two equivalence relations each on a standard Borel space, so if you're not familiar with these things, think of a complete separable metric space, the Baer space or the Cantor space. Um, and we say that E is Borel reducible to F if there's a Borel function such that a pair of things on the E side uh, is E equivalent if and only if their images are F equivalent. And so a very important example for this is if we take the space of all countable models for some language. So let's take a countable relational vocabulary, I call it curly V, with relation symbols RI, RI has arity AI, and then you can code any V structure by a uh, characteristic function. And so it will be an element of this product of two to the n to the AI. And so that's basically Cantor space. And so uh, we have this space of countable structures. I guess I didn't say it, but by countable structures, I'm going to focus on structures with underlying set the naturals. And then it all nicely fits into this framework. So we have this Borel space of structures for V. Okay? Um, and so similarly, if we don't want all structures for some sentence, some theory, then we can consider that subspace. Um, and as an equivalence relation, we focus on the isomorphism relation. Um, and so this definition from this old paper of Harvey Friedman and Lee Stanley is that uh, the isomorphism relation is said to be Borel complete if every other isomorphism relation uh, Borel reduces to it. Okay, so there are many examples of these things. Um, graphs is such a basic example, even in that first paper of Harvey Friedman and Lee Stanley, Oh, it's folklore. Um, obviously not phrased in that way, but so graphs is a standard example. Groups, trees, linear orders, fields, Boolean algebras is a more recent result, and then I did some work with Sheila Miller. We show, showed that quandals also are uh, Borel complete. Uh, quandals are these weird algebraic structures that can be used to classify knots. But our paper shows that basically it's a bad idea because knots are simpler than these are. <laughs> so, okay, so that's Borel completeness. How do we prove that an isomorphism relation is Borel complete? Well, we basically do it by taking graphs and embedding it into whatever class of structures we're working with. Uh, my work with Sheila Miller, we show how to encode a graph into a quandal. And this is exactly like what has been done from a different perspective in category theory also for decades. So let's do a bit of category theory perspective. Remember, a category has a class of objects and a class of morphisms between objects. For any two objects, you have a set of morphisms between them. And you have a composition function, you have identity functions, and they satisfy very basic uh, axioms for composition. Um, and so we have the very basic example of if we look at a category of structures for some vocabulary, we have the category whose objects are all models for some sentence, 
and whose morphisms are all the homomorphisms for that, for that language, for that vocabulary. Um, and the category theorists call a category like that an algebraic category. So what kind of embeddings were the category theorists interested in? Well, first of all, a functor, so have I actually defined it? I guess I haven't. Oh, yes. So a functor is basically a homomorphism of categories. It takes objects to objects. It takes morphisms to morphisms in a way that respects domain, codomain, composition, and identities. So a functor is said to be full if for any two objects, f restricted to that set of homomorphisms between the two objects is surjective. So if you've got two objects in the first category, then you're basically surjecting, well, I'm just repeating myself, aren't I? Uh, <laughs> anyway, so surjective for the local home sets is full, and then faithful is injective for the local home sets. So for any two objects from the first one, if you have a, two homomorphisms between them, they go to distinct homomorphisms after applying the, uh, the functor. So they have this phrase, fully faithful. You might think that would be some fancy kind of faithful. No, it just means full and faithful. And then also a full embedding, if it's full and injective not only on, ob on morphisms but also on objects. And I would note that a fully faithful functor can only fail to be an embedding if it identifies isomorphic objects. So let me quickly give the proof of that. So if, uh, if f of a equals f of b, then by fullness, Uh, some f from a to b is such that f of f is the identity for f of a, and similarly some g from b to a satisfies that. And so F and G will be the isomorphisms between A and B. Okay, you just by um, functoriality. Okay, so fully faithful or full embedding from a category theory point of view, it's really not much of a distinction. But from the point of view of uh, Borel considerations where sometimes selectors are hard or impossible to find, I think it's an important distinction to make. Um, so we don't have any results about the distinction yet, but I think it could very give some very nice results, particularly if you want to get up the nose of the homotopy type theory people who say that all isomorphisms are equalities. So. Um, that's a perhaps an uh, something worth digging into. So, sorry. Um, yeah, their their univalence axiom states that isomorphism is equality. So, anyway. Ah, okay. Okay, an important distinction. Okay, never mind then. Let's go on. Uh, so uh, from the category theory point of view, you've got a category being algebraically universal if it emits a full embedding from every other algebraic category. So this is exactly analogous to Borel complete in the set theory setting. Um, and this has been studied by the category theorists for years. The reason I'm aware of it is 
Um, for example, we had earlier today Alejandro uh, mention Vopienka's principle. And a very nice way to uh, express Vopienka's principle in category theory is that there is no proper class size collection of graphs with no homomorphisms between them other than the identity homomorphisms. The fact that that is equivalent to Vopienka's principle comes from understanding the fact that um, the category of graphs is algebraically universal. Okay, so this does connect to interesting things in category theory. So the basic idea here is let's smush these two ideas of maximal complexity together and see what we get. First of all, there's a lot on the screen, but it's basically a very natural definition for a Borel category. It should be a category where the space of objects is a Borel space, and the space of morphisms is a Borel space, and all of the co domain, codomain, uh, composition, and identity maps, they should all be Borel maps. Um, a cute thing to note is that although composition is partial, the domain will still so uh, nothing to worry about there. And so the basic example for this will be our category, sorry, our Borel space of structures, and now we're going to take the morphisms to be the set of triples, M, N, F, such that F is a homomorphism from M to N, okay? And then this, uh, this Borel category, this is a Borel category. The domain and codomain uh, functions are just the projections on the first two coordinates, so they're obviously Borel, uh, but it's easier to check for composition and identity as well. Okay, so a Borel functor is just going to be what it should be. It's going to be a map from objects to objects and morphisms to morphisms, each of them being a Borel map. Um, and of course it should be functorial, it should respect everything a functor should. Okay? And, and the first thing to note is that isomorphism with the Borel reducibility set theoretic setup, we kind of have to just impose isomorphism from the outside, something that the setup doesn't know about. Whereas with Borel functors, it starts to trick any Borel functor must respect isomorphism simply because um, isomorphism is defined in terms of composing to give the identity, and functors respect composition and identity. But they need not, Borel functors need not respect non-isomorphism, okay? So we now have a few steps of increasing strength of what kind of embedding do you want between your categories? Um, so a functorial Borel reduction is basically the bare minimum. We want it to be functorial and we want it to be a Borel reduction. Okay, a bit of a crude way to do it because what we really want, when I was working on quandles, it's like, okay, I've got a Borel reduction, but it's not functorial and it's, not that you want two separate things, you want the, the fact that you respect the isomorphism to sort of flow out of the functoriality. So we actually are interested in fully faithful Borel functors and um, the Borel equivalent of full embeddings. So I've called those full functorial Borel embeddings. Embedding gets comes up quite a lot here, so it's good to clarify. Um, so a point to note here is that any fully faithful Borel functor is a functorial Borel reduction. You uh, similarly, simple exercise, very similar to that argument, you get that any fully faithful uh, functor actually respects non-isomorphism as well as isomorphism. Okay, great, so that's the end of my slides. Uh, so I want to now actually give you an example, do a proof on the board. And so 
With this setup, you might think this is great. There's the category theorists have been studying this for decades. There's a whole book of these things. Now I can just drag them all back into set theory and hooray. And what's more, there's what people might call a sort of church's thesis for countable constructions. So I heard Simon Thomas say this at one of the young set theories a few years ago. So this is the statement that any hands-on construction of countable structures from countable structures will be Borel, okay? And all of the results in the category theory literature are hands-on constructions. So you might think, hooray, lots of free theorems. But, <laughs> that is what we thought, but, <laughs> but there's the word countable you have to look out for. And this is a, an important, if um, often easily got around distinction, is that sometimes the category theory constructions raise your cardinality. Just because they didn't have to be careful for their setting, and so we have to work a little bit harder to preserve countability. So what I want to actually prove to you um, is uh, sort of a proposition along the way to showing that the category of graphs is universal for this notion of full functorial Borel embedding. Uh, and that is that for any ball vocabulary uh, curly V, the category of V structures uh, has a full functorial Borel embedding to the category of W structures where every uh, relation in W is binary. Um, right, and the main point being which preserves Accountability. Okay? So what we want to do is given any countable vocabulary and any structure for that vocabulary, we need to encode it into um, a structure with only bi for a binary vocabulary. It will be in countably infinite binary vocabulary. The point is, once things are binary, it's much easier then to get your hands on and code them into a single binary relation. And that step actually flows through the same way that it does uh, in the category theory case. Um, so this is the key step where we've got a bit of a difference. And if you look in the category theory books, the argument they use, which doesn't preserve countable countability, is that, okay, you take some kappa, um, at least the supremum of the arities of the relations. And to code up your model with underlying set X, you look at the maps from that cardinal to X. So what we're going to do is, um, so proof, we will code X with uh, I for I in omega into a structure uh, 
with underlying set x to the less than omega. And a binary relation corresponding to each ri and a binary relation for every n in omega, another one, and one more binary relation. So, okay. So, what are my relations going to be? Well, for T, basically, T is going to look like this. We've got x to less than omega, so we've got the empty set at the bottom, and then for any x in capital X, I've got the singleton x, I've got the pair, I've got the triple, and so on. And I also want to add this edge in here. No, xx. So I just want to have constant tuples for x. And then for any other element y, do the same thing. OK, so um, x is in t relation to y if and only if both are constant tuples with uh, the same uh, repeated element Uh, let's call it x, and either um, x tilde concatenated with one extra copy of x equals y, or uh, x is empty and y is the, the pair. Okay? So it's a binary relation. Uh, and so for most members of x to less than omega, it doesn't crop up in this binary relation at all. OK? That's T. Now I'll tell you what S and R are, and R bar. Uh. Right, I am aware of the time. So. S, N, so X is going to be an SN relation to Y if and only if the length of X equals the length of Y, both of them greater than N, and um, x n, the nth entry in x, is the entry that is constantly appearing in y. So let's write it this way, x n equals y n. y, of course, uh, and this y is a constant tuple. OK? And then finally, x ri bar y, if and only if um, the length of x is the arity of the original relation ri, and um, Let's call this thing M, our model, and our model thought that Ri 
holds of x. Okay, no mention of y at all in that. Okay, I claim that by coding up our models into, sorry? There is no y here. It's just, we could use unary predicates, but then it wouldn't be the case that all of our predicates are binary. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've told you how to act on models. How do I act on functions given f from m to n um, define, I guess I should call this m bar, define f bar from m bar to n bar component wise. So elements of m bar are just tuples, and I'm telling you to just apply f to every component. Okay, so I have no time, so I'll just wave my hands at why this works. It's straightforward to check that f is functorial. The issue is why is it full? This t, any homomorphism that respects t, basically these branches, each branch in the M must be sent to a branch in the N. These triangles, because we've got no loops, branches go to branches. And so whatever um, this singleton X will go to singleton something else, that will be our F of X, okay? Once we've got F defined on the tuples, the S's tell you that it all coheres, and our function that we start with is indeed a component-wise function. And then finally, the R's tell you, well, it was component-wise, and so actually it came from a homomorphism. Okay? So that's the extra, the slightly different tweak to make uh, this work, and so we do get that the category of graphs is uh, universal for this notion of Borel embedding. Uh, let me finally say there are lots more directions you can take this. First of all, that list of examples, do they all work? No, they don't, because most of them, like groups or quandals, you have many endomorphisms, which you don't have in the graphs case. So you do get an interesting distinction there. You can also extend it in interesting ways. Uh, there's um, invariant universality and uh, complete analytic um, quasi-orders. Notions from Borel reducibility can also be carried across to this setting, okay? It's work in progress. We've only really just started, but I think it's an interesting area to pursue. So I'll leave it there. <laughs>